Ooh, a package. Hey, Jason from Bohemia Bees. Well, we got a special delivery today and we're really excited about it. And we want to share with you with what we got. Um, this is something right from uh, Bloomfield, Missouri. Uh, Stevens Bee Company, Corey at Stevens Bee Company uh, has been working with us for, for many years. About a couple years back, uh, maybe three or four years ago, we picked up some of his uh, VH, VSH Mite Biter queens uh, and we had them uh, in our apiary. Uh, bringing some diversification in genetics um, into the apiary. And we received a package today, as you saw, uh, of some more queens. So let's take a look at what we got and let's talk about what we have. Okay, so we've got our Jay-Z BZ box that we received, as you saw. Um, in it, we have our order of queens from Stevens Bee Company. Um, we're going to go ahead and open that up and show you what we have. As you can see, there are 11 queens that we had uh, purchased from Corey. Um, these are virgin queens. Uh, these are not mated queens. Um, and there is something unique about these queens um, in that they are um, from, uh, if everyone knows Natalie, uh, be, uh, she is a beekeeper as well. Uh, she was doing a bit, and I'll put a link in the description below to the actual video that she's published, if it's already published or not. But she went and visited Corey and did some grafting. And Corey was generous enough to, to when in my order, give me uh, some of her grafted queens and some of his grafted queens. So these are all virgin queens. As you can see, this is your standard queen cage that they come in um, with your fondant plug. Um, and then your virgin queen with attendants, if you can see in that cage. And it's kind of hard to see. Um, but these queens... Um, this particular one has an N on it, which tells me that this was grafted by Natalie. Um, and so I have some of Corey's and I have some of Natalie's grafts uh, for these virgins. These are not mated uh, yet, so they will still need to be mated in my apiary. But um, we find that bringing them into our apiary, allowing them to be mated and come back, gives a good um, cross blend of... Missouri VSH genetics with my local drone, uh, Bohemia B, um, Warwick, Maryland, Eastern Shore, Maryland genetics. Uh, it allows to have a good solid queen that comes out and puts a really good, and I keep saying the word genetics and why is that important? Let's, let's talk about that for a second. Okay, so we talk a lot about genetics and, and I am in not in no way an expert on genetics. Um, I'm still in the process of getting, uh, learning more about grafting my own Queens. I have grafted my own Queens here for a couple of years. Um, I do a lot of walkaway splits as well. Uh, and some of these terms that I may be using to a newer beekeeper or a non beekeeper may be a little bit foreign or maybe a little bizarre. Um, I'm here to tell you that, uh, beekeeping is way more than just putting bees in a box. Uh, beekeeping is about understanding the genetics that you have uh, in that box, understanding you know a host of other things in addition to just resources, bee volume, um, and various other types of things. Many people are familiar with the traditional breeds of queens. When someone says, "What breed of queen do you have? What breed that?" and, and most people understand that there are Italians, Carniolans, uh, Russian. Uh, and there's even the Africanized uh, breed of, t uh, of bees, which we won't get into in this, this um, but it'll at least give you a sense to understand that breeds of queen are important, um, but know that once a queen is integrated in your apiary and is either mated in your apiary or is a generation after uh, the initial queen that you've installed, whether it came from a package or whether it came from a nuke, and then maybe you've done a split and then mated that queen um, in your apiary, uh, you, you have a different strain of genetics. You have genetics that are, are in tune with what um, the bees that were mated together, whether the queen was introduced out of, uh, you know, a, a queen from your apiary uh, or were like these virgins that we have here. Um, and I know these terms sort of come are funny to say I have virgin queens. Um, 
Here's a quick video that I'll show you that um, is from, um, I believe was filmed over in, uh, in England on how uh, queens are mated. So take a look at this video real quick and then we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about genetics. during the mating ceremony. When the queen returns from her maiden flight, she keeps five million sperms in her sperm. So as you can see, it's pretty fascinating, right? Um, we think that, you know, giving credit to that, that group that put that together is, you know, link in the description below where we found it from. We're gonna to continue to give them credit on that short video. It's very informative for the non-beekeeper um, or even the, the novice beekeeper to understand the process in which a queen is mated, right? Um, your colony has majority of its 90%, you know, worker bee, uh, and then naturally you have a, uh, a queen bee that's in there. It's typically one queen bee, and then there's about 10 to 15% drones. Drones are the boy bees. Um, we've shown you in a couple other videos, and we're going to have a couple more videos about rearing queens. Um, I think the key thing to remember about queens in general is the genetics that they have and the disposition that they may have within your apiary. Are they survivable? Um, a lot of times, many beekeepers have struggles with their uh, new uh, package that they installed because those queens were bred, mated, or raised and mated in uh, a different climate or different region, likely um, in, in Georgia, likely in uh, the southern part of the U.S. Uh, if you're in a northern part uh, beekeeper uh, or a western a Midwest beekeeper, wherever you're keeping bees, uh, every region is different. Your local area, even 10 miles down the road, is different. So you should be really cognizant of what's happening within your colony, you know, track data, try to understand the diversity of genetics. And we can talk for hours about genetics and I don't wanna bore you. Um, I wanna show you what we're gonna do with these queens um, that we have here that we received from Corey. Um, we do, again, as I mentioned before, raise our own queens here. We do grafting a uh, very limited amount. Um, we do import queens from others such as uh, in uh, uh, Wood Camp Apiary. Uh, we also, have a few other uh, contacts and groups that we work with bringing queens in to diversify our genetics to continuously shape what we call as the Bohemia Bee Mutt. What is the Bohemia Bee Mutt? That's typically the queens that I sell, uh, and those queens are uh, a diversification of uh, different types, whether it's Saskatraz, that's another offshoot, Buckfest is another commonly known breed, um, Carniolan is a, is a common one in my apiary as well. All have different reasons to why those breeds work well in different regions. And here, if you look at the chart on the screen right now, you'll see um, that if you look at these variations, uh, a lot of them are good for, you know, whether it be pest, uh, pest resistance, uh, helping to mitigate that pesky varroa mite uh, and making sure that they can uh, hygienically keep that hive um, to the point to where they will not have issues with varroa um, and the viruses that come with the uh, varroa to help decimate the hive, right? So that's one thing that a lot of genetics or a lot of people, specifically Corey at Stevens Bee Company, is focused on as trying to ensure that his bees have those hygienic qualities. And there's a lot of good videos out there on how to test for hygienic qualities. We're not going to talk about that here on this, this video. We're going to, again, talk about what we're doing here at the Bohemian Apiary as far as queens uh, and try to be informative to our audience uh, without going too much detail. Um, I've talked a lot now, so let's let's kind of uh, wrap up and go out into the yard and take a look at putting some queens into um, a colony. Uh, but the point I'm making is is that you know every colony needs a queen, and every co every every colony needs to have diversified genetics based on the region that you live in and that you are you're putting in. Thinking that you can just put a package of bees where a queen that was mated in Georgia. Um, is going to survive year over year. You might be lucky and you probably will have good success if you tend to those bees, uh, uh, you know, and such. But 
for the most part, if you have better genetics that are unique to your region or your area with, uh, you know, mated queens that are mated in your apiary or in and around your apiary um, from drones from your apiary, um, you can you can have better success with overwintering, better success with uh, whether it be hygienic qualities and such. So we've got these 11 queens. Let's stop talking. Let's get out into the yard, put them into a few colonies, track and see what happens uh, as they go out and get mated. Now, the one thing to consider is that when you have a virgin queen that's not mated that you're introducing into a hive, she's going to need to go out. So the timeline that Corey and, is, is recommended to his uh, you know, his clients that purchase bees from him is to, to leave that, that queen caged in that new colony for at least six days, right? So she's a virgin queen. So a lot of times, um, if you have any eggs in your colony, so if you look through your colony, you have any one to two or three day old eggs or four day old eggs, that colony may apt to want to produce a queen cell or queen from their own eggs that are there, then accept this virgin queen. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into that colony cut out any queen cells, look for any, um, look for any eggs that may be in there um, and, and, and try to create an environment that's, that's going to accept that queen bee. Um, if your colony uh, has been queenless for a little while, uh, hopefully not to the point to where it has a laying worker, that's a whole other discussion. Um, but if it is queenless for at least a period of a week or two, it'll be accepted a lot likely when they come, what Corey has coined the hopeless uh, hopelessly needing that that queen or hopelessly uh, failing hive, right? Where So they're just desperate for accepting a new queen. And those types of scenarios, the ideal scenario to accept uh, a new queen, whether it be a mated or virgin queen, uh, specifically virgin queens. So uh, the other fear that we have is when we put these in the colony and we're going to place them in between the frames, we'll show you outside, um, is that allowing that queen to be released and then getting out to be mated and coming back. There is a good chance that they could be uh, not returned from that mating flight. Um, where there's scenarios where there's dragonflies, birds, and others that will pick off a large fat queen once she's mated and flying through the air, as you saw in the video. So there is that risk, um, and there's a risk with anything like that. But um, I think what we'd like to do here is to try out uh, new genetics, try different things, uh, rather than just injecting mighty queens uh, into our colonies. We want to bring in queens and then allow them to mate with our drones here that are at the Bohemia Apiary and, and get a different type of bee that's unique to this area. So without further ado, let's stop talking and let's go out in the apiary. Okay, so out in the apiary now, and uh, we're gonna take this colony that we have, that we know is queenless. We have several that are queenless, at least for a week, at least maybe five to seven days, which tells me that, that if they should not have any, what I would define as four day old eggs, they should really be past that point of allowing them to build out a queen cell. If they've already built out a queen cell, then we're going to cut those queen cells out. Again, sort of restarting the process for those bees to allow them to accept this virgin queen. We're going to also put tape on top of the queen cell cage or the queen cage, excuse me, uh, to prevent them from immediately cleaning that plug, that fondant plug out and releasing her too fast. We want to make sure that she can be adapted in there. Uh, so let's take a look inside this hive right here. Okay, so this hive um, has been queenless for a little while. We're going to make sure that they um, don't have any eggs like we mentioned. This is done over a, um, a double screen board. We make splits over double screen boards here. We have another video we talk about why we do that. We're not going to talk about that much. But this allows these bees that are hatching out. There's a lot more bee volume in here than there was the other day. What I'm looking for now is, as this is a queenless colony, I'm looking for any of the brood that remains to not be 40 years old or not have a queen cell. So I'm looking at this colony, thinking that they potentially started to build a queen cell because they're queenless. But if they did not have any four day old eggs, four day old eggs, they likely did not. So I see a, I see a larva that's about eight days, nine days old. I see capped brood, which is nine, 10 days plus old. Um, they're potentially gonna be hatching out. Um, and I don't see where they've built any queen cells. We got one right here over here. So you can see right here, 
We got a queen cup. And what you would do is you would pinch that off to remove that opportunity for them to build a queen cell. I'm looking at this side now. I do see a couple uh, young larvae that's just recently hatched out, but it looks like it's a little more than four day old. So I think we're good with them not wanting to be able to build a queen cell. Good bee, bee volume still, good opportunity for them to still take some time. All right, so we got this another frame here. We got another cell down here that they're probably taking an egg. If we open that up, we can see a, a charged larva in there. So we're gonna pinch that off as well. There's another one up here. Get the bee out of it. Pinch that off as well. And I don't see any more on this frame. Knocking down all the cells that potentially could create the reason for them not to accept our virgin queen. It's a resource frame, but we're gonna check it either way. There's some eggs on this frame that I don't, that are probably still three days old or about to hatch. So what I'm gonna do with this frame is take it out and put it in another colony so that I don't have, again, a frame that has eggs. And I'm gonna condense down my frames and I'll come back and add a frame or two in here. A lot of people worry about the fact that they have, don't have all their frames in their colony. They're like, oh, that's too much space. It's going to create wild comb. A small nucleus colony like this will not create wild comb because there's not enough bees to do that that fast. Their focus is on the resources of these five frames or six frames, and they're not worried about building cross comb in that gap yet. Now, you don't want to leave that should you have enough bees to cover all five of these frames and they start to build out that comb to connect that big gap. You absolutely don't want to leave that for a longer period, but for a shorter period, it is okay to reduce them down to the only the five frames that they can manage so that they can mitigate some of the pests like the small high beetle and such. Let's take our queen and we're going to pull. The first one is a, is a Natalie virgin queen that she grafted. So Natalie with Beekeeping Like a Girl, that's I think that's her name of her channel. We'll put a link in the description. We're gonna take this queen and we're gonna open up a gap in the middle. We're going to take some painter's tape. Hopefully, if I can get the end. Nothing like trying to find the end of a tape roll. And all I'm doing is just taking a small piece of tape and putting it on the ends of this queen cage so that they don't go in and eat that out too fast. I don't know if you can see that or not. There's my queen cage with the tape on it, okay? So I'm gonna put that in between my frames. And tomorrow, I'm gonna to come back and pull the tape off. I'm gonna give them one day in a queenless colony, even though, because they had young larvae in here, I don't feel that they were queenless for that long. I'm gonna take the tape off and then allow them the next two or three days to, to progress. I might even leave the tape on for two days. It really depends on what I see in this colony. So there's my first install of my queen in a, in a, in a queenless colony, that I queenless split that I have. We're gonna hopefully allow this to uh, mature and build out uh, to, uh, to a, a virgin queen. So we'll have some follow-up videos as we continue to install the other, other queens and, and see where they do, but we'll come back to this one and let you see how it works out. We wanted to be able to share how we install these queens or our process for doing that. All right, so there you have it. It's pretty simple of a process. We're taking bees, we're injecting them, putting them into a colony that's queenless, allowing them to get uh, accepted and then hopefully released and mated. Um, it is a lengthy process. Um, as you know, when you look at the timeline of how long it typically takes, it's going to take at least four to five days for this queen to be accepted in this colony. At that point in time, she's going to be ready for her mating flights. 
and it's going to take a couple days for that to occur of over a four to five day period for her to come back and actually start to lay and we see eggs in this colony it's going to be a little bit of time and so we need to be patient with this colony and while we'll still come back to check it in a couple days probably two days we'll come back uh, to check to pull that tape off to allow them to start to release her normally into the colony um, we're going to uh, uh, let them do their thing right we're not going to disturb these bees we're not going to come in here and continuously try to uh, try to uh, check on them and, and examine them or dissect them we're going to make sure they have food resources coming in still that's important um, we can feed right now if you don't have any honey supers on uh, but they do have two strong frames of honey and they're still bringing in a small uh, amount of it to uh, in the back part of the flow. So I'm not concerned about that, um, but we want to make sure that we monitor uh, that as well, the weight of the hive. There you have it. That's what we do to install a queen, to bring genetics into our apiary, to diversify the things that we look for um, in our colonies to help build strong colonies, to help build bohemia bees. Um, so I appreciate you watching. Hit that subscribe button down in the, the bottom corner follow along, set the alerts button so that when we do the follow-up video of this to see how well Corey's graphs and Natalie's graphs do, um, you definitely want to follow up and see how that happens. So uh, and see which ones take better. Uh, it's a little bit of a competition for you. So Natalie and, uh, and Corey, let's see whose graphs uh, created uh, the more prolific virgin queens uh, and here at Bohemia Apiary where beekeeping is definitely more than a hobby. It's an obsession. Thanks for watching, everyone. Take it easy.